following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So today we are going into the introduction of uh, Gnostic Kabbalah. We have to emphasize in the word Gnostic because you find outside of uh, this uh, school different groups which study Kabbalah. If you go to the bookstores, also you will find many books related with Kabbalah, but very seldom you find the Initiatic Kabbalah, which is always related with the path of the self-realization, the way in which we learn why we have to awake the consciousness, why we have to enter into the initiation. Because most of the books of Kabbalah that you find outside in this uh, world are related with what we call the traditional Kabbalah, which is related with uh, mysticism of Judaism. That's why we emphasize the Gnostic, uh, pointing the word Gnosis, which means knowledge. There is in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, two trees that uh, the book of Genesis uh, refers to. The first uh, tree is the tree of knowledge. And they uh, pointed at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as I told you, knowledge in Greek is gnosis. But also in Hebrew, knowledge is the word that. So that is knowledge. And the uh, tree of knowledge is related with alchemy. So alchemy, as you know, is the way in which we uh, take advantage of our energies in order to transform them for our own purpose, for our own goal, which is the separation. This tree of knowledge is sex itself, of the sexual energy. And in order for you to comprehend and to understand that, it is good to refer to the Bible again. Because when the, uh, the Bible is referring to the sexual act between Adam and Eve, you find that they use the word knowledge in order to refer to it. They said, and Adam knew his wife, and she begot her first son, who was Cain. So I want to point the word new, but the word that he knew his wife is pointing 
to know. And the tree of knowledge, of course, is sex. So it is related. And every time that the Bible talks about the sexual act, it's always using the word knowledge or, or, or the verb to know. As when Mary, for instance, was, uh, was going to begat Jesus, she answers to the angel Gabriel, How am I going to be pregnant when I am not? Oh, I do not know any man. So to know, as I'm repeating, this is a word that in which the Bible is always hidden, the sexual act. And uh, that is uh, precisely a sephira which is hidden within the tree of life. Now I am referring to another tree. The tree of life is the other tree which is in the Garden of Eden. And uh, the tree of life, of course, is another symbol for the different parts of the being. And uh, the Kabbalah symbolizes uh, the tree of life with the symbol of the ten sephirah which we see in the graphic, beginning with the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These ten spheres are called the ten sephirah. The sephirah is a plural for sephirah. And many Kabbalists they always point that the word sephira means saphir, which is a, a jewel which symbolizes a part of the being. But other uh, Kabbalists says that the word sephira means coming out from nothingness. And it is because the ten sephiras are ten emanations that are coming from the source which is called nothingness. This nothingness is above the first sephira. And precisely is that that we are going to talk or to enter into this conversation, this lecture, later on. But what I want to emphasize is that the tree of life is, of course, the different parts of the being. And this tree of life is related with the man as well. Remember that when we name the word man, the root of this word is coming from the Sanskrit. Man, manas, which means mind. So, man, or the man that we talk here, is that creature that has mind, that has objective reasoning, that is a human mind. This human being can exist within the female body or male body. So we have to emphasize that because uh, uh, many times we use the word man as male. But really, in the strict sense of the word, man is a being that has mind, objective reasoning. And of course, the tree of life, the ten sephirah, are related with the real man and with the universe. The real man is a creature who is into the likeness of God and who is related with the universe. So we are going to study how the real human being or the man is related with the universe. To study the tree of life is of course to study the universe itself and the man itself. So, Kabbalah is precisely the study of the tree of life, the ten sephirah. And uh, alchemy is the study of the tree of knowledge. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is alchemy, is always hidden within the tree of life. 
and is symbolized with this mysterious, mysterious circle which is in the throat of this uh, figure that we see in this graphic. You scarcely can see it because it's a circle that has no symbol, has no color, has no any reference, only a circle. While the other circles, you always find the name in it, uh, a symbol in it, a color in it, because it's related with its own symbol. But that is that mysterious sector that is prohibited to talk about. When I say this, I remember in this very moment an experience that I had many years ago when I went uh, uh, into Israel. In Israel, as you know, the Jewish people, their mysticism is Kabbalah, the tree of life. But among them, it's very rare to find someone that knows about that. Because they, the, the, the rabbis or the teachers there always hide that. So I went there and I was teaching to them the mystery of that, which precisely was something amazed for them because they never hear about it. But other ears, of course, that knew about were angry with me or with my uh, lectures. So later on, when I left Israel, I had an experience. And this experience was precisely of a black magician who was in the astral plane trying to hypnotize me. And I remember that he was uh, hypnotizing me and telling me at the same time, you have to forget the mystery of that. Forget the mystery of that. In the same dream, I was listening to this black magician and I knew that he was referring to all the knowledge that I was given related with the Kabbalah. How I'm going to forget something that I am experiencing, that I am practicing. And what happened is that in this world, you find two types of Kabbalists. The intellectual Kabbalist and the intuitive Kabbalist. The intellectual Kabbalist is that one that memorizes the traditional Kabbalah, that study Kabbalah, but has no experience direct experience related with the Sephira. Of course, in the beginning, when we learn this, we have just an information of the ten Sephira. But an intuitive Kabbalist is the one that traverses on the path of the initiation and is experiencing the different mysterious Sephira with his own consciousness. So when you experience something in your consciousness, you cannot forget. So this black magician was telling me to forget because he uh, thought that I was memorizing something, or that I was uh, reading something, but he ignored that I am, I was, and I am still a mission that is working with Kabbalah and alchemy. So, the mystery of that, of course, is not something that I am imagining or reading, but I am practicing, because it's the mystery of alchemy. So, you cannot understand one tree without the other. So, if you want to understand Kabbalah, the tree of life, you have to, to know alchemy. In, in order to understand the alchemy, you have to study Kabbalah, or the Tree of Life. Kabbalah, or the word Kabbalah, comes from the word Kabel in Hebrew, which means to receive. And of course, it's because the real Kabbalah is received in the consciousness. Even though, in this very moment, you are receiving the knowledge. So you are, of course, receiving it with your intellect. But later on, you have to understand that in order to make that knowledge, it's 
experience the world. You have to practice. And you are going to understand many uh, secrets, many questions that you have from ancient times or from past with this knowledge. Because Kabbalah, or the science of numbers, or the mysterious tree of life, is something that is related with the universe. It's something that is there in the superior world that you can learn through the initiation. In the ancient times, in the time of uh, Atlantis, there was an organization which uh, is named the Akaldan Society. The Akaldan Society was an organization of initiates of the Atlantean civilization. Between parentheses, the Atlantean civilization is the same Maya civilization. In this day and age, you see that there are many anthropologists that are trying to explain the mystery of the Maya civilization. They ignore that Mayas and Atlantis are the same one. In the time of the Golden Age, the Maya Atlantean people in the Akkadian society were studying the signs of numbers that in this time is called Kabbalah very deeply. And that's why in Yucatan, Mexico, you find a book of Kabbalah which is written by a shaman, a Maya shaman, which is called Shilam Balam of Shumayel. Shumayel is a town of Yucatan. Shilam Balam means in uh, Maya language the Jaguar shaman, or the shaman Jaguar, which means a master that is that is illuminated and knows everything about Kabbalah. So in that book you find, of course, many prophecies made in a mathematical way, Kabbalistic way. And when you study Maya uh, knowledge, you find that they talk about the 13 cartoons. And of course, the 13 cartoons are related with the 13 sephirah, because in reality, as I was telling you, there are ten sephirahs here, or ten spheres, but there are three which are unknown, which are hidden. And that's why the Mayas talk about thirteen heavens, thirteen katun, which are related, of course, with the science of number. Only knowing Kabbalah very deeply is how you can enter into the mysteries of the Mayas. In the universal plot, as you know, many of those lands the Maya lands were of course covered by water. And when the water diminished, and then the ruins of the great civilization remained. That's why you find that the pyramids of Yucatan, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and also the pyramids in Egypt are made by the same Atlanteans. The pyramids of Yucatan and, and, and that pyramids that are in America are older than the pyramids that you find in, in Africa, in, in Egypt. So the point is, of course, that uh, this Atlantic civilization disappeared, but the Maya knowledge is still alive within the four dimensions. At that time, in the Atlantic civilization, the Akkadian society were transferring all the knowledge into different civilizations. And now it's coming to my mind the civilization of uh, Chaldea that existed after Atlantean civilization. Chaldea inherited all the knowledge of Kabbalah. And in Chaldea was precisely where we find this uh, uh, prophet Abraham that was coming from the city of Or which in Hebrew, or means light. For from the city of Or, Abraham, who was very knowledgeable in Kabbalah, astrology, and many other ancient times, 
went into Egypt. And in Egypt, of course, he learned more since the Egyptians were also uh, people that inherited this type of knowledge of Kabbalah. And that's why in Egypt was a place where Moses, being a priest of the Temple of Sides, a priest of Osiris and Isis, learned a lot of this knowledge. And Moses received, not only in the physical plane, but in the internal plane, all of the knowledge in order to give to the future uh, civilization or, or future race that is our actual Aryan race. And of course, for that uh, purpose, there was a special people that were being prepared in order to establish a source of wisdom in order to spread the knowledge in all the planets. And that's why Moses received the Kabbalah in three ways. The first uh, part of the doctrine that Moses received was the Sohar. The Sohar in the beginning was just transmitted from lips to the ears of many initiates. But later on, many rabbis wrote the mysterious Sohar, which is called the Spirit of the Doctrine. And of course, there is also another book that Moses gave, which is called Talmud. And the Talmud is the soul of the doctrine. So based in the spirit of the doctrine, the Zohar, and the Talmud, the soul of the doctrine, was written the body of the doctrine. And the body of the doctrine, of course, is the Bible. That's why in the Bible, which is the body of the doctrine, you find many symbols, many stories, that if you don't know the spirit and soul of the doctrine, you then enter into confusion. That is precisely the, unfortunately, the disgrace of our actual Aryan race. Because all the world has the body of the doctrine, which is the Bible, or the written by all the prophets, and in very rare cases, we find people that know about Sohar and Talmud. In most of the cases, the Christians that have the Bible, they are scared of Kabbalah because they ignore about it. And they think that it's an obscure science that will take them away from the real path, while they ignore that by knowing Kabbalah is how they are going to understand the wisdom of the Bible. I am pointing this in order to, to uh, make you know that in these times the Jews have the Kabbalah, the traditional Kabbalah that was given to Moses, but they refused in ancient times to give the knowledge to the public, to all the world, and that's why Jesus was crucified, because Jesus came into the Jewish race in order to make universal that was only for the race of Israel at that time. But they, of course, as you know, they didn't want it. And uh, uh, that's why after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he dictated another book of Kabbalah, which is called the Pisti Sophia. The Pisti Sophia is a Kabbalistic book as well, dictated by the Master Jesus to his disciples. And of course, is the way in which Jesus is uh, delivering the knowledge that was uh, in the beginning planned to give uh, by the Israelites to the Aryan race. So the Kabbalah that we teach here is to start with that initiatic Kabbalah that was, that was taught in the Atlantean civilization in the Chaldean civilization, Egyptian civilization, and then after Jesus was given in the secret places in order to keep ahead with the path of the civilization. But in this time, as I said, there are many uh, traditional Kabbalists that uh, think that only the Jews know about Kabbalah. But this is something that you have to understand because there are many books in the bookstore that talk in different ways uh, of the different Kabbalah that exist. 
A book that I advise you to read is the book of John Fortune, Mystical Kabbalah, in which you find precisely the Initiatic Kabbalah, because there are other writers that knew about Kabbalah, but they were, of course, also deviated right, from the real path. And that's why we cannot advise to read other books if there is not an initiate, white initiate. Because there are two types of niches, black and white. The white niches are the ones that are giving the Initiatic Kabbalah, the ones that we start. The Kabbalists, Atlantean Mayan Kabbalists, they teach that there are 13 Katun, or in other words, 13 Sephira. Because every Sephira is a mysterious uh, jewel of wisdom which is, in, in, in my language, Katun. So, the three that we don't see here, we don't see it precisely because they, they are unknown. In the Hebrew language is how we find in this day and age the names of all the Sephira and the names of all of the, of the name of all the wisdom related with it because the Hebrew language is related with the mystery of the Bible and many other mysteries. It's a language that is coming from the Golden language and many other languages. And uh, in the Hebrew language we find that above this Sephira, which is the first one, that is called Keter, which means the crown, because it's above the head of this symbolic figure of a man which is here, in the graphic. But above Keter, the crown, there are three mysterious sephirahs that are called the first one from above, Ain. And Ain, A-I-N, in Hebrew means nothingness. The second one below Ain is called the Ain Sub, and is translated as the Limitless, which is the Limitless, Ain Sub, is the second aspect of that that in Gnosticism we call Absolute. So, after the Ain Sub, we find the third aspect of the Absolute, which is called the aim of all. A I N for aim. S O P H sub. And or is written A U R. So the aim of or means the limit less light. So these are the three aspects of the unknown. The unknown in synthesis is what Moses refers as a Elohim. If you see the word, for instance, Elohim, it's a Hebrew word for gods and goddesses. That is always wrongly translated uh, in the Bible as God, because really the word Elohim is not God in Hebrew. The word God in Hebrew is El by itself, E. L, L. But when you say Elohim, means God and Goddess, the plural word. But when you add at the beginning of the word Elohim the, the letter A, and then you are saying something that is unknown. A Elohim means that deity that is really Seity. Because always when we name that uh, divinity above the crown, we said C-E-T, with S. C-E-T, which is something more than deity. The deity is the divinity expressed in the universe. But C-E-T is that unknown. 
we will say that our non deity. So Elohim is deity, and I Elohim is the deity. That is precisely what Moses points that we should not have any image of it because it's unknown. So these three parts, Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Or, are precisely the 11, 12, and 13 heaven that the Mayans talked about. So the three superior parts of that which is unknown. And of course, there are many uh, ways or many names we will say in which we find in different philosophies and religions about this unknown, which is the absolute. We call it the absolute. This is how we have to understand. We are when we are pointing the absolute is that unknown part within which everything emerges. And of course, that everything is symbolized as a tree of life. The first thing that emerges from the unknown is the light. For that light within the unknown is that where we call the Ains of Or. The Ains of Or is called by Gurdjieff, the great uh, master of the beginning of this century, he called the, the Ains of Or, the first emanation of the unknown, within the unknown, the Okidanok, with K, O, K, I, D, A, N, O, C, K, Okidanok. The ray of Okidanok is what in Greek is called Christ. So Christ, as you know, is not a person, but the first emanation of the unknown. The unknown is also called the eternal cosmic common father, within which the eternal cosmic common mother is within. So the ray of Okidanok that is coming from the Ain Sof has to manifest the creation of the Ain Sof. But in order to create anything, this ray of Okiramok, this light with Christ, has to divide itself into three parts. And that's why the first thing that we find in the tree of life is the first triangle which are called the three supernal. It is called also the triangle of divinity, the logos. Logos in Greek means word. That's why in Gnosticism we say this is the first word, the second word, and the third word. First logos, second logos, and third logos. The three together is that which uh, is called the Holy Trinity, because it's three in one, the Holy Three Unity. In Christianity they say the three persons in one God, but of course it's a symbol when we say person, because there's no personality there, it's just forces energy, divine energy. These three forces in the tree of life, the first one, as I said in the beginning, is called Keter, which in Hebrew means crown. And it's called crown, it's always above the head of a symbolized man. From Keter, the crown, emanates the second sephira, which is called Chokmah. Chokmah means in Hebrew wisdom. And from Chokmah, 
the second sephira emanates the third, which is Bina, which in Hebrew means intelligence or understanding. So these three sephirahs, Keter, Chokmah, Bina, are the three parts of one divinity, which is Christ, which is symbolized in different names. For instance, in the ancient Egypt, the three parts of this divinity together is called Osiris. That's why the name Osiris Ra in the ancient Egypt is symbolizing the three parts in one. And Osiris Ra, of course, is a father in Egyptian symbology. It is good to uh, remember this because in actuality, in this day and age, there are many people that think that the ancient Egypt were, uh, were pre uh, praising idols. But we have to understand that every symbol in the ancient Egypt, every figure, etc., is a symbol of something that is within the tree of life, within each one of us. So Osiris Ra is a representation of the three parts. And why it's called the Father? Because really, this first triangle is represented by the first uh, sephira, which is Keter. Because the tree of life is divided in three columns. The column of the right, which is the column of mercy. The column of the left, which is the column of severity. And the column of the center, which is the column of the consciousness. And of course, in the middle, which is the, col the column of the middle, you find the equilibrium of the tree of life. And that's why in the, in the column of the middle, which is the column of the consciousness, you find that the equilibrium of this column is based on the three primary forces that we call the Holy Trinity. That's why, at the top of the column of the middle, you find that the equilibrium, the center of gravity of the first triangle, is precisely in Keter, the Father. Call it the Father, because in Christianity, the Holy Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in Christianity, there is a custom of, of calling the second sephira the Christ, the Son. And it's because all of the wisdom of this deity here, which is Christ in three parts, all of the wisdom of that resides precisely in Chokmah, that's why Chokmah means wisdom. In the Brahmanism, among the Brahmans, the Brahmans, you find that these three forces are called the first one, Brahma, the second one, Vishnu, and Vishnu in Sanskrit means he who penetrates. And that's why if you uh, disclose the word wisdom, in English, you find that it formed with two words. With, that comes to remind us the word this, which means to see. And dom, which means power. So when you say this dom, it's the power of seeing. So wisdom, in other words, is the power of seeing. Power to see. But the power to see resides in the Lord of Christ. That's why I repeat in Sanskrit it's called Vishnu, which means he who penetrates. When we can penetrate within everything, then we are developing wisdom. And the only one that penetrates in all of the matter and everything that exists is 
crack to this loop. And of course, Bina is called in, in Brahmanism Shiva. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three forces are related in Brahmanism with that femininity of God, the feminine part. Because remember that in Gnosticism, God is not male, neither female, but both. Androgynous. Andros is a man, Genica a woman. Androgynous means man woman, or male female. That's why in Brahmanism, the wife of Brahma is called Sarasvati. The wife of Vishnu is called Lakshmi. And the wife of Shiva, Parvati. Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati are the three parts of the feminine aspect of divinity. That which in synthesis is called Shakti. Shakti is precisely that feminine power or that feminine energy which is hidden in the matter. So this feminine aspect of God is never talked about in any Kabbalist book because it's something that you have to discover it when you work with that, the mystery of alchemy. So there are many Kabbalists that say that that, this mysterious sephira, is a union of this Bina and Chokma, these two in here. But they are wrong, of course, and we are going to explain that in the next way, in the lecture. We know very well that the union of Shiva Shakti, or the female and male part of God, is precisely the mysterious secular Da'at, knowledge the mysterious union of Adam and Eve. In the Bible, but the Kabbalists name the feminine aspect of God with the name Shekinah. S-H-E-K-E-N-A. Shekinah at the, at the end is an H. Shekinah. So this Shekinah is the Divine Mother that I said is represented in, in Brahmanism with the name of Sarawasti, Parvati, and Lakshmi. Naming, of course, that these three separate, the femininity of God is hidden. When we talk about the feminine aspect of divinity, in Gnosticism, we say that she has wisdom, love, and power. This is the three aspects of the Divine Mother. Wisdom, love, and power. But that wisdom, love, and power is manifested when this divinity, this, fe this feminine divinity, is displayed her power, which is creation. The three, the first triangle, which is the triangle of creation, is the three forces that create. But in order to create these three forces, they also have to manifest themselves in two. And this two is the first couple that the Bible talks as Jehovah. Jehovah is the Bible name for the androgenic divinity. Because Jah is the masculine part of God, and Hava is Eve, the feminine aspect. So Jahava or Jehovah, Jehovah, is a feminine name, which is representing the first couple. 
you find that all religions are founded in these three forces. Because without the Holy Trinity, nothing can exist. So below this triangle that we're talking about, the triangle of divinity, Keter, Okmar, and Binah, we find another triangle. And you see that from the third emerges the fourth. This fourth, so Petra, is called Chesed, which means mercy. But it's also called Gedula, which is love. Sometimes you find it at Gedula or of uh, Chesed. Gedula, Chesed, is Atman in Sanskrit. Atman, the real man, because is the emanation of God. It's also called the Son of God. Because really, as you see, emanates from God, the divinity, from the Holy Spirit, from Bina, from Shiva, the Holy Spirit, emanates the Spirit. This Atman is the individual, particular spirit or being that we have within. That is, that part to whom Jesus refers when he says the prayer of the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This Atman, the ineffable one. Every single being has its own Atman. I have my own Atman, you have your own Atman, anybody has his own Atman, his own spirit, being, angel, in other words. And this the spirit is the son of Christ, the son of God. Of course, we always exert for the union of souls, the union with our own particular Atman, but Adman exerts for the union with Christ. So, Adman is what we call the monad. Our own particular unity. For this Adman has his cosmic consciousness. Adman the ineffable <coughs> dwells always in the sixth dimension. Sixth dimension is the dwelling of all the monads. And uh, all the knowledge related with that is placed in Gebura. Gebura is the following sephira, which means strength. So Gebura is the divine soul, the cosmic consciousness of the spirit. In Sanskrit, it's called Buddhi. B U D D H I, Buddhi, which means wisdom. Because in every spirit, in every monarch, there is always an inheritance, a type of wisdom, which is related with Christ. And there is always deposited within Gebura, within Buddhi the cosmic consciousness, the divine soul of the spirit, which is always feminine. And of course, Atman and Bumi is always the master, which is above. When somebody enters into the initiation, this Atman and Bumi integrate and form that that we call the master. So the master is never the soul, it's never anybody being below, but Atman Buddhi, the spirit and divine soul, that is the master. That master has, of course, a masculine soul as well, a human soul. That human soul is the following sephirah, which is called Tiferet. Tiferet is precisely beauty, the human soul. That human part 
or that moment, that human soul that has to fight, that warrior that has to struggle in order to attain the control of the lower sephirah on the direction of his own moment. Different sometimes obeys his own spirit, sometimes doesn't obey his own spirit. There are many souls that do not obey. Do not obey. So we have to understand that the human part, the human consciousness, is always submitted to many trials. Part of the human soul is the one that descends into the law of evolution and evolution. Is that consciousness, is that soul that we have within, that we call Burata, an embryo soul, part of the human soul which is above in the sixth dimension. So in the sixth dimension we find the holy trinity that the Brahmanism and Theosophy talked about, which is Atman, Bodhi, Manas. This other trinity is below the other trinity. This Atman, Bodhi, Manas is only the monad of each one of us. It's in the sixth dimension. Atman, Bodhi, Manas. Manas, in Sanskrit, as I said, is mind. So this is a superior mind in Sanskrit. That's why it's called superior manas. Abstract mind. A type of mind that does not think. It's called intuitive mind. Something that you have to experience in order to understand. Because what is below the superior manner is the inferior manner. And then we enter into the third triangle. You see, the second triangle is in the sixth dimension. This first triangle is in the seventh dimension. Seventh dimension, sixth dimension. And now we are entering into the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension is related with these two sephirah. The first one here, which is emanating from Tiferet, which is the human soul, the superior manas, is called Nesah, which means victory. Nesah, victory, is the mental body, which in Sanskrit is called inferior manas or inferior mind, this intellectual mind that rationalizes. So we have to make a difference between the superior mind and the inferior. With the superior, you have an intuitive mind that does not think, that does not think. But the inferior mind does think, rationalize. It's precisely the mind that we have to control. And is within the fifth dimension, which is eternity. From the Sa Imanet Hod, which is glory, and is related with the astral body, or body of emotion, called in Sanskrit Kama Rupa, or vehicle of desire. And because in that astral body we have all of the desires, the ego, in the other words. Hod, the Kamarupa, the astral body, and the mental body, which is the Ta, abide in the fifth dimension, which is eternity. Eternity is a circle that has a beginning and an end. Eternity is not, as many think, time without ending. We enter into the circle of eternity when we physically die. And we leave that circle of eternity when we reborn again in a new body. Of course, the other circle which we enter in is the circle of time, which is related 
with the next sephira, which is Yesod is foundation in Hebrew. And in that sephira that is in the fourth dimension, the fourth dimension is time. Yesod, foundation, is the ethereal body, or etheric body. That uh, we call vital body, which is the superior part of the physical body. If the vital body is the superior part of the physical body, it means that the physical body is the inferior part of it. And that's why we find it below. The last part of the tree of life in the graphic is called Malkut, which is the kingdom. Because really this physical world is related with the four kingdoms, mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and human kingdom. This is what is the whole planet Earth, this physical world. But it's only the inferior part of the sword, which is the vital body. This is how we are constituted, how everything is constituted. I told you in the beginning that in the column of the middle, you find the equilibrium of the center of gravity of the whole tree. That's why I told you that the first triangle has its center of gravity in Keter. But since God is always the one that can equilibrate and perform everything perfect, you find that the second sephira in this middle column from our love is Tiferet, which is the human soul. That's why you find here that the sun, which is called Christ of man, deposited his equilibrium in Tiferet. That's why this second triangle has its equilibrium in Tiferet, but is Chokmah, the second aspect of God, that is equilibrating this second triangle here. That's why Tiferet is related with the heart. And many times I told you that in the heart we have the atom nous. That atom nous that is related with Christ. And that's why when we talk about the soul, the human soul, in order to be liberated, in order to be free, in order to be saved, has to be always through the Lord in his second aspect, wisdom. When the Lord is saving somebody, he is here incarnated in the heart, in the human soul, as wisdom. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the ones that control the whole tree. The Father controls the first triangle in the head. The Son controls the second triangle in the heart. And the Holy Spirit controls the third triangle, always in the column of the middle, in the soul. And the soul, of course, is related to the sexual land. That's why, physically speaking, we have the Father in the head, the Son in the heart, and the Holy Spirit in the sexual land. Malkut is in the feet. This is how you understand when in the Bible says, you shall not fornicate, because whosoever fornicates sins against his own body. Or do, you, or do you ignore that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells in it? That's why fornication is related with the Holy Spirit, because foundation, Yesod, is related always. The equilibrium of the Holy Spirit is in the sex, in our body. The equilibrium of the Lord, the Christ, the Son, is in the heart, in the Father here. When we talk about Kabbalah, or the development of the soul, or the consciousness, in the, trans, in the column of the middle, 
you find that there are three types of souls that the Bible talks about. The first soul is the one that is related with the thought, which is called Nefesh. Nefesh is a soul which is related with the animal force, with instinct. But then we have the thinking soul. The thinking soul is Rua, located here in the heart. And above, we find the other soul that is called Neshama, the spiritual soul. So there are the three main types of souls that we talk. Nefesh, Rua, and Neshama. Neshama illuminates Rua. And that's why the thinking soul controls Nefesh, the instinctive soul, with the work of alchemy. And you see here that in the column of the middle is Sa'at. That mysterious sephira that I'm telling you is related with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Nothing. So that's why in order to acquire the dominion of the whole tree, you have to work in the column of the middle. And in order to work in the column of the middle, you have to work with the mystery especially at the heart. And of course, we are going to explain how this mystery of the heart is the work of God in the throat and in the sex. But because when we talk about creation in this lower plane, lower plane, you know that in order to create, we need a special energy. In order to create an animal, a plant, or a human being, we need a sexual act. So the union of the two forces, the feminine and the masculine. But it's related with this lower part of the Holy Spirit. But when divinity, when God is creating, because here below we create, you know, and lust is involved in it, and many things of the lower nefesh soul, which is the infinite soul. But above, when God creates, He creates with the power of the word, with the power of the verb. That's why it's here, that. That's why it's written. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. In Genesis, it says, In the beginning, God said, Let there be light, and the light was. Because divinity here creates through the throat. So the sexual energy of the tree of life works in two ways. Through the sexual land and through the throat. This humanity knows how to create with the sexual gland, but they ignore how to create with the throat. Because in order to create with the throat, you have to work in the column of the middle, in the path of the initiation, in order to acquire the powers of all the parts of the being, of all the parts of the life. But when the man and the woman are abusing of the sexual energy here, they cannot enter into the mystery of the tree of life. That's why it's written. Now the man and the woman that are eating from the tree of the evil, from the tree of knowledge, let them taken away from eating. Because otherwise they will eat, or they will, in other words, enjoy from all of these parts of the being and being degenerated. So in order to enter there, we have to be in chastity. We have to know the mystery of God. The tree of life, that's why, is divided in four worlds. Four worlds. The first triangle is called the world of Atilus, or the world of archetypes. Absolute in Gnosticism 
or many Gnostic writings is called Pleoma. You find that word many times, Pleoma. Pleoma is absolutely the same. The second world is the world of Bria. And Bria is a world of creation, which is in Gnosticism, Gnosis. This is how you find the Gnosis of the Master, of the creation, the creative force of the Master, is Bria. And it's related with the second triangle. The third triangle is related with the world of Yetirah, the world of splendors, or the world of the angels. In Gnosticism, we said, is a world of Psyche. Psyche, Gnosis, Pleroma. But we are giving here the names that you find in Kabbalah, Atilut, Bria, and Yetirah. And the fourth one, the fourth world is related with the physical world. This Sephira, which is by itself alone, at its point, and is the world of Asia. The world of Asia is many times, many times mistaken with the word Asia because it's very similar. When they write Asia, Asia, the world of Asia, People write Asia, with Asia, and they think that they are talking about a, a, the continent of Asia. The book of Revelation talks about this, this, uh, the seven churches in Asia. But people think that it's Asia, and that's why there are many Bible readers that they think that they are talking and they are looking for seven material temples in Asia, because they know about Kabbalah. So they are the, these are the four manifested worlds. There is another world here below, the world of Asia, which is the physical world, which is the world of Klippa. Klippa is what in uh, many religions called hell, inferno, but Klippa is a plural word which means shell. The single world of Klippas is Klippa, which means shell. And Klippas are all of the Sephiroth, all of them, in the inverse way, in the negative way. That's why when we study Klippas, we have to study all the negative aspects. Demon, in other words. Hell, inferno, which are always below the physical world, below here. You don't see here Klippas, but it's below, beneath, underneath the layers of the earth, it's clip pot. And of course, we also study, in every, in every world that we are pointing here, we always study the ten sephira, always, all of them. Because every world is the manifestation of the whole tree. There is a world here that I'm going to point you, which is called the Serampin. The Serampin is the world in which the ten sephirah is manifested to, the number six. The Serampin is that master in which all of the sephirah are manifested. The human being, the world. That's why the Serampin is a reflection what we call the Arik, the K. A R I K, Arik Ampin. The Arik Ampin is the heavenly man above, and the Serampin is the man below. So, in this studies of Kabbalah, we are going to study, of course, all of the world and to understand and comprehend in detail the whole doctrine, in order to understand what is written, that is the Bible. And not only the Bible, but all the books. Because everything is related with it. So it is good to memorize every name 
of etc. in Hebrew because sometimes I am referring to the names. Keter, Ochma, Bina, Gerula, Gebura, Tiferet, Netza, Hod, Yesod, Malkut. And below Malkut, Klippot. Above the first, which is Keter, Ein Sof Or, Ein Sof Ein. Ten manifested sephirah. Three unmanifested sephirah. And one fallen sephirah. That tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge, is a mysterious sephirah, but it is not with any symbol because it is not located in any place. But it is related with all. Meaning that in order to enter in any of them, even in the unknown, we need the mystery of that, which is the mystery of alchemy. That's why uh, many Kabbalists, they study a lot of the, of the tree of life, ten sectors. But they don't know a bit of that. They know that means knowledge, no. But they think that is knowledge acquired by memorizing or repeating some things, they ignore that that is something related with the sexual energy. Nobody can develop the history of that without transmitting the sexual energy. With a key, yeah. It's a key, of course, a clue. That's why we said Gnostic Kabbalah, which means the two trees are together. Gnostic Kabbalah in this time, is related with the uh, knowledge that we're teaching here, which is Kabbalah, secret knowledge, from where Judaism and Christianity emerged. Because Judaism has its foundation in Kabbalah, and Christianity comes from Judaism, and of course it's also Kabbalah. But also we have to study uh, the other thumb of the knowledge, because we have two hands. One form of the knowledge is what we call Christianity. And in order to study Christianity, you have to study Kabbalah. And the other thumb is Buddhism. And in order to study Buddhism, we have to study Brahmanism. Because Buddhism comes from Hinduism. And that is what is noticed together. Buddhism and Christianity. What's the difference between the spirit and the divine soul? The spirit is the being. And the divine soul is the, the feminine consciousness of the spirit. That's why the, the feminine soul is like the, the, the feminine aspect that you find in the, in the Middle Ages. That the warrior which is always a knight with, with his armor fighting against the dragon in order to conquer the lady, the mighty, right? Which is always the spiritual soul. The spiritual soul is symbolized in many ways. When you read, for instance, the son of sons of, the, uh, of Solomon, Solomon itself represents Abner, the ineffable. And the beautiful uh, Sulamit, uh, I believe it is in the Sun Sun, the name of the Divine Soul, is here, the Divine Soul. And of course, the human soul is always that night in the round table, for instance. The human soul is uh, Lancelot. The Divine Soul is Winifred. And the King Arthur, or the Atman. And in the three, is developed the whole drama that you have to know as subterism in order to understand. Because really, the divine soul is the wife of the spirit, but it's also the wife of the human soul, because the three are one. The moment. That above, for instance, my spirit, and he has a spiritual soul, who is the divine, united like betrothed. But I am 
want to, to marry her too. I want to be united with her. Because when we are united, the human soul, the divine soul and the spirit, is the master. But in order for the human soul to be united with these two, two forces, it has to disintegrate the ego. Because these two parts are always pure, holy. And this part, which is the human part, has to be clean. Has to clean himself or herself. That's why here the human soul is always longing for the union with the beloved. For me, the beloved is the feminine aspect of my monad. For you, who because you are feminine, you are the masculine aspect of your monad. You want to you be united with the masculine beloved one. The masculine, the masculine aspect of your monad. That union is what we call religion or yoga. That is acquired through the initiation. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, I'm